My guest today is Father Festo Makenda, SJ, who is on the history faculty at Xavier University in Cincinnati. We'll be talking about his forthcoming new book, A Splash of Diamond. Good morning, Father Festo. Good morning. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. I feel very honored and I'm looking forward to our discussion today. Why don't we begin by your painting a picture of your background. Tell us your story, if you will. Thank you. Um, I always think that I have very little to say about myself. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a Jesuit priest uh, from Tanzania. I belong to the Eastern African province of the Society of Jesus. And I'm currently based here in Cincinnati, Ohio. We'll begin teaching at Xavier University uh, in fall teaching African history. Uh, I'm a specialist in African history. I research mainly on Jesuit history in Africa and political history of Africa. Um, so that's me, that's uh, first of Ken. Well, I'm so delighted we can spend this time together talking about what I know will be a very important book. Why don't you, um, uh, in a nutshell, tell us what A Splash of Diamond is all about? Oh, thank you for the good question. Uh, the Splash of Diamond is, is, is a small book about the history of the Canadian Jesuits in Ethiopia and their important work in helping the Ethiopian government under Haile Selassie to modernize the education system in Ethiopia. And so the little book tells that story with a combination of text and pictures that are accessible to the ordinary general readership and of interest, of great interest to people in Ethiopia, to people who know uh, uh, the, the history of Ethiopia after uh, the, after the defeat of the Italian uh, fascist regime in 1941. Um, and so anybody interested in that history will find the, the, the book uh, of interest. And this really is a very unique book, isn't it? Or it will be when it comes out soon. Uh, there's no comparable book, is there? I don't know of any. I know there are some stories, uh, there are some articles written about the modernization of uh, education in Ethiopia. I've not seen someone who has written, who has focused specifically on the contribution of Canadian Jesuits to that process. And I felt that it was so remarkable of them. They did a great work. And I think my book will make that contribution in a very specific way. Well, and you know, I um, taught for three years with the um, French Canadian Jesuits at Tafferty McConnell School. And they were extraordinary teachers and wonderful mentors and made a, a tremendous contribution to uh, the country through their work. So, That's certainly the impression I get from the sources and I'm really happy to hear you confirming that. I must add that it's because I learned that you you taught there and you taught with the Jesuits. That's why I looked for you and finally we got in contact. And here we are, <laughs> which is great. Now, tell me um, what motivated you? It takes a, a lot of energy to write a book, uh, time and energy. So what really motivated you? What drove you to write this book? Thank you for a great question. I, I, I was motivated, I would say, by three things, uh, three independent or interlinked things, really. The first one is my own knowledge as I read the sources, my own knowledge of just how much Emperor Haile Selassie valued education. He really liked the education and he invested a lot in making sure that the Ethiopian youth, especially after the fall of the Italian regime in Ethiopia, 
he did everything he could to make sure that the Ethiopian youth get a modern education. And that, I think, impressed me and made me want to dig more, to know more about this interest of Ethiopia. And that leads me to the second uh, element uh, of, of my interest, is that the emperor himself figured out who would be able to help him modernize the education system, and he focused on Canadian Jesuits, uh, which I find of great interest. So that's another in, uh, element that the Canadian, the story of the Canadians, why the Canadians, and what they did there. I want to tell that story. I find it a fascinating story. And finally, um, the Canadians went to Ethiopia, but they started a new chapter in a broader narrative of Jesuit history in Ethiopia and in Eastern Africa in general. And I mean, I'm interested in telling that story as well and putting that uh, Canadian Jesuit chapter in that larger Jesuit history uh, perspective. Now, you correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I've been known to be wrong on occasion, but I believe um, Emperor Haile Selassie had a French-Canadian Jesuit tutor, did he not at one point? Uh, he studied with I have not, a Jesuit, I think. I have not come across that information. I would really <laughs> love to find it. Uh, but up to now, I, I, I don't have any source that has pointed to that link. And I you can be sure, you can be sure that I've really tried to dig out why Canadians, why mm -hmm. French speaking Canadians uh, and all that. Uh, but I've, I've not come across that link yet. It might I be seem there. to recall it, but I'm not <laughs> sure of that. And uh, I do know though, yeah. that um, his Majesty's second language yes. was French. Certainly, uh, and in 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 the most of his communications with the Jesuits, the Canadian Jesuits, were actually in 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 French. They wrote to each other in French, and and so some of the sources I find in the archives is is correspondence, his letters to Father Lucien Marte, for example would be in French and vice versa. Well, it would be an interesting fact um, how he was aware of the French Canadian Jesuits, why he would invite them. So um, anyway, let's go on. Um, tell me, it's a fascinating book title. It may not be obvious to everyone, how you came up with the title, uh, A Splash of Diamonds. So why don't you tell us? <laughs> That's interesting, even to me, because I never really made up my mind uh, on the title until I was almost halfway through uh, working, writing the book. And uh, the Splash of Diamond is really a play uh, on two ideas. The first one, again, as I started by saying, is the emperor's own uh, understanding of education. And I'm going to read you a quotation from the emperor's own speech, even before he became emperor, a speech he gave in 1925, when he was opening his own school, Tafari Makonen School. And the emperor said this in 1925. Many books have been written the effect that knowledge is a treasure that must be grasped and which no one can confiscate. It is a diamond without price, which prevents the breaking of heaven's decrees and preserves one from the path of destruction. This is one of his fascinating uh, quotes showing just how much he treasured uh, education. And he calls it here, diamond without price. And that uh, contributed to my, uh, my title, my choice of the title. The second is that this year, 2020, we mark 75 years since uh -huh. the Canadian Jesuits went to Ethiopia. And this is a, a jubilee year for that reason. It is a diamond 
that month jubilee so these two ideas together i informed my choice of the of the title and if education is like a diamond i look at this as really a splash of diamond an abundance of diamond uh, because what came out of that encounter um, has been invaluable for ethiopia and for africa in general actually I've heard of a splash of scotch, but this is the first time I'd heard a splash of diamond. And I think it's a great title. Uh, it's you. intriguing, which makes, <laughs> makes the book even more interesting to readers. Well, speaking of readers, yes. who are you writing this book for? Who do you see as the natural readership for this book? I'm, I'm looking for a very broad type of readership. And for that reason, I am really avoiding making it overly scholarly. So what I'm doing is I'm combining text and images uh, for, for easy, leisurely uh, readership. And for that reason, I, I look at people who are interested in understanding how Ethiopian education system developed after the Italians left the country in 1941. I'm also looking at people who are interested, who would know something about Jesuit history in Ethiopia and are interested in this specific part of that history. And I'm looking at people who were part of uh, Tafari Makonen school in the 50s and 60s, in, indeed from 1945 onwards. And finally, people who would know the history of the beginnings of what is the University of Addis Ababa today, which started, which started as the university college, university college of Addis Ababa, under really the leadership of the Jesuits as that was entrusted to them by Emperor Haile Selassie. So as you can see, it's a broad kind of readership that I'm looking for. It's not necessarily an, an expert kind of readership. I'm not just like writing to scholars, but anybody who would want to be informed by those general subjects would find this book easily accessible. Great. Well, I am a future reader for sure. I'm excited. And to I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing <laughs> the book. Now, why don't we go into the content in a little more detail and take us, if you will, on a brief tour of the chapters in very, The Splash of Diamond. I'm very happy to do that. Um, so generally, as I said, um, I'm trying to put everything in a very simple, accessible way. And my chapter headings are equally very simple. So my first chapter, I give it the, the title, Before the Canadians. In this chapter, I briefly tell the story of the Jesuits in Ethiopia in the 16th and 17th centuries. Uh, this is important because it will help the reader understand why the emperor, for example, invites the Jesuits back to Ethiopia in the, in, in the 20th century, but invites them under very strict conditions that they were not to come as priests or religious Catholic men. They were not to practice any kind of proselytism and all that. Mm. You need that old history of Jesuits in Ethiopia to really be able to put uh, the emperor's conditions in context. And so quickly, that first chapter in a very condensed and summarized way and yet simple way tells that story and gives the reader a background. Which brings me to the second chapter, which I call Ethiopia Calls Again. Ethiopia, or rather, Ethiopia Calling Again. And here I dwell on the emperor now inviting the Jesus back into Ethiopia in 1945. And I dig deeper into the conditions of the emperor. Why did he choose Jesuits? Why did he insist that they had to come from Canada and not anywhere else, not in France, not in Britain, for example? Uh, this second chapter dwells on those topics and, 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 and then um, uh, brings me to the third chapter, 
which is Tafari Makonen School. When the Jesuits came to Ethiopia, they had a broad task of helping the Ethiopian government to modernize its own education system and really establish institutions uh, of learning in the country. Um, the first task they were given was running the emperor's own school, uh, Tafari Makonen School which is an important school that started way back in 1925, established by Emperor Haile Selassie, when at that time he was a, a, a regent, not an emperor yet, uh, but a school that was run down by the Italian uh, occupying government. So after the Italians left and Jesuits were invited, but they were entrusted this school was entrusted to them so that they could bring it uh, back to its uh, status again. And, and, and so I tell that story, what the Jesuits did in Tafari Makonen School, of course, in collaboration with so many other people, including you, all those volunteers who went to Tafari Makonen and taught at the school. So the, the third chapter tells that important story of Tafari Makonen. And this uh, leads to a fourth chapter, which I call the University College of Addis Ababa. Um, as Tafari Makonen grew and other schools were established in Ethiopia, the emperor was also very keen uh, that Ethiopian students, Ethiopian young men and women get tertiary education. Previously, he had been sending them outside the country but as mm -hmm. the schools within, in, within Ethiopia were generating more candidates for higher learning, this was no longer practical. And he wanted to establish uh, uh, institutions of higher learning within Ethiopia itself. And again, and again, this is important, he entrusted that task to the Canadian Jesuits. So I tell that story in my fourth chapter, and I tell it in such a way that I show how the University College of Addis Ababa started. Of course, it's, it developed into uh, the University of Addis Ababa as it is today. And anybody interested in the story behind that university today would love to read my fourth chapter of the book. Uh, my fifth chapter tells the story of uh, Tafari Makonen, uh, University College of Addis Ababa and beyond. Here I'm already in the second half of the 1960s when Jesuits are beginning to wind down and move away from those two institutions, partly because of the political changes within Ethiopia itself, uh, but also partly because they were now free to explore other apostolic possibilities within Ethiopia. So my fifth chapter tells that story. Jesuits moving out of Tafari Makonen School and out of the University College of Addis Ababa and venturing into other activities within Ethiopia. And this then brings me to my last chapter, which I call Ethiopia in East Africa. And what, mm -hmm. what happens here is that uh, in 1976, the Jesuits started the Jesuit province of Eastern Africa which at that time had six countries in it, five countries in it actually at that time, that is Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, Sudan, and Ethiopia. Today it's made up of six countries because of the division of, of Sudan into Sudan and South Sudan. So when that province was created in 1976, Ethiopia was included in, included in it. And Ethiopia had enormous impact on the larger East African province, partly because historically they were the first. The Jesuits had been in Ethiopia the longest. But also the Canadian Jesuits who previously had been based in, in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, as they were pulling out of those institutions within Ethiopia, they went beyond Ethiopia into other parts of East Africa. And this last chapter tells of their contribution in the broader context of Eastern Africa. And, and, and this then brings me to the end of the book. Well, thank you. Um, I'm gonna throw in a question that's yes, a little more yes. personal. Of course, you basically have two professions in a sense uh, with your doctorate from Oxford 
in your prior books, you're a professional historian. Yes. You're also a Jesuit priest. What above all else drew you to the Jesuits as an order? Pardon? What drew you to the Jesuits as an order? So <laughs> probably this calls me to tell you a little bit more about my own vocation to join the Jesuits. Please. So uh, <laughs> from very early on in my life, I wanted to be a priest. But then as I grew up and I, I discovered that I had a vocation to a life of scholarship, research uh, and all that. And as I figured out what to do with these two interests that I had as a, as a young man, uh, it occurred to me that the Jesus uh, committed to scholarship and to education in general, and that they would appreciate that from me. And so that's how I came to choose to join the Jesuits. Um, and so I joined, trained for the priesthood and have been ordained uh, for ministry. At the same time, I'm aware that the Jesuit community appreciates my own contribution as a scholar, as a researcher, and as a historian. And in the last 10 years, for example, I've researched a lot on Jesuit history in Africa. I've published a lot on that. And I consider that to be a valuable service to the Jesuit order as well. Beyond that, I'm a teacher. I've been teaching uh, not just Jesuits by non-Jesuits, not just Catholics, but anybody. I teach African history in general, not just Jesuit history. So I feel that in that way, I'm making a contribution that is valued by the church and by the Society of Jesus as well. And you're currently at Xavier, which is a very fine institution, and I'm sure teaching a wide range of students. I will begin, um, I'm new here, I'll begin teaching in the fall, um, but I'm already excited by the possibility of teaching two courses, one on Africa before the colonial period, uh, from 1450 to 1880, and the second course will be on Africa under colonialism from 1880 to 1960s, and I'm even just preparing the causes is already very exciting for me, and I'm looking forward to making my contribution here. So a perfect marriage of professions. Absolutely. The Jesuits and your professional historian. I have to say, the Jesuits I taught with at Tuffin Manconan are the finest teachers I have ever um, come into contact with, and it was a great honor and pleasure to teach with them. They were I'm also very, very happy to hear that. They were also a very can do, um, very practical man. And I recall vividly when I was in, assigned to Tuffet and McConnell, I uh, met with Father Garo, who was the chief academic officer. And he said, um, I would like you to teach ancient history. <clears throat> And I said, well, I've never studied ancient history. I've studied history. And Father Garo said, uh, what's your point? And I said, well, I'm not prepared. He said, then prepare, start reading, because <laughs> you are teaching ancient mm -hmm. history. So get to work. and." <laughs> and start reading and here's some books I recommend and as long as you stay ahead of the students you'll be fine but mm -hmm. get to that work. sounds to me like a very <laughs> Jesuit way of doing things um, yeah very can do and um, anyway now tell me what the writing experience was like it, it it has been exciting, uh, beginning with the researching process, looking for the documents and getting clues and following them until you, you can build up the story. It's been exciting. And the writing itself, putting the narrative together, it's been a, a learning experience for me. Uh, I've written about this story before, 
have written articles uh, that are heavily scholarly, uh, but to now put the material together for a general readership in an mm. accessible way, it's been uh, interesting and a learning experience as well. Uh, I'm always reminding myself that you don't need so many footnotes <laughs> <laughs> with as little as you can and all that. It's been an, a learning experience. I am telling the story and, and every time I ask myself, would my brother understand this? Would my sister at home be able to relate with this story and stuff like that? So it's been an exciting process and a learning experience for me as well. It's been growthful. Yes. It's involved change, which is great. Yeah. Right? yeah Good for us all. Now, when can we expect to buy this book? And uh, do you know yet where we will buy it? Of course, it'll, it'll be on, everything's on Amazon. But uh, have you decided on the publisher and have you set a publication date? I have not yet, um, and I guess I could uh, give a few more details uh, uh, to that question. Uh, the first is that I'm still finishing up the writing. Uh, I, I, as, I, I, as I told you the details of the six chapters, you will be happy to know that I'm currently working on the last chapter. Ah, um, so good. It will still take a little bit of time. I'll probably be done with that chapter by the end of this month. Uh, but that's the textual part of the book. I still have to collect uh, uh, photographs. As I said, I want it to be well illustrated with pictures. And I still have to track down enough illustrations, enough pictures to include in the publications. And I hope I'll be able to do that uh, within the month of May and, and, and June and hopefully uh, in the middle, in, towards the end of June, mid-July, I should have a complete manuscript that I can propose to a publisher, which brings me to the second part of your question, um, publishing. I'm really interested in making sure that this book is available first and foremost to people in Ethiopia, to people in the larger context of Eastern Africa, but also available globally. Um, and so I am looking, uh, I'm really thinking still on what kind of a publisher would be able to accommodate uh, those uh, contexts. The, that's the Eastern African context on the one hand and the global context, especially the global North context on the other hand. I wouldn't say that I have figured out exactly who would be able to do that. Um, there are a few challenges associated with that. One is that uh, it's easy to get a publisher in the global north, but then the book might not reach East Africa, or it would reach East Africa in a cost that people might not be able to, 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 mm. to afford. Uh, it's easy to publish it in East Africa, and then I think once it is published there, it would be cheap enough for people in the Global North to order copies. Uh, but that would depend on whether I might be able to get funds to subsidize the publication so that it's produced in a quality that is of global mm. standard, but at the same time accessible to people in East Africa at an affordable price. So those are the challenges I'm facing. Uh, I have not been able to solve them. But um, once I have the full manuscript, I think I'll begin to approach possible right. publishers. And As they say, them. first things first. Yes. yes. Write the book and then manage the book. And they are different, aren't they? Managing a book yes. is very important. That's right. If you want readers. Yeah. But it's very different from writing the book. That's so true. Yeah. Well, I hope we have another occasion soon to discuss uh, your book as your work progresses. Uh, you and I will be talking later this week with some Tuffet, former Tuffet and McConan teachers 
So that'll be, I'm looking forward to that. That'll be fascinating. And I'm really uh, looking forward to that opportunity as well. Well, Father Festo, this has been a pleasure and a privilege talking with you. I want to thank you for taking the time to tell us about uh, A Splash of Diamond. Uh, it sounds like an intriguing book. I'm looking forward to reading it. And I wish you a safe and satisfying week ahead. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for your interest in the book. I really appreciate this.